Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Let us pray together. Almighty God, and to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Precede and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Job. Job said, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. There an upright person could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there. Or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness, and thick darkness would cover my face. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading verses 1 through 15, Psalm 22, found on the bottom of, of page 3 of your leaf pit. Let's read the uh, psalm responsively by verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? Oh my God, I cry in the time, but you do not answer. I have a dwell, but I find no rest. 
Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him protect him if he provides him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many are the bulls me, strong bulls that have me. They open wide their jaws at me, like a ravening and a roaring lion. I am the Lord God, like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is in my breast, my breast is in my breast. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. A reading from the book of Hebrews. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with wholeness, boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, and sisters, mothers, and children, and fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, I have two eyes that lately have required the care of a couple of different ophthalmic specialists, and I have three pairs of prescription eyeglasses, plus all the drugstore cheaters that float around my house. And I have great trouble just guiding thread through the eye of a needle, thank you very much. A camel? Through the eye of a needle? Come on. The very absurdity of it is, of course, what makes us remember it. It is beyond impossible. That's it. The rich are out. And Mark, who has spent 10 chapters explaining the reign of God and making it clear that the reign of God is right here, right now, sitting among us, and promising that we don't have to do anything special to live in the kingdom of God, that it is open to the youngest and dumbest little child. Well, Mark sweeps all of it away by repeating that little phrase of Jesus, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. It is a radical and upsetting statement coming from our warm and loving Lord it is radical because it is so absolute. Picture a camel. Now picture the eye of a needle. There's no wiggle room there. 
Not even a little camel could get through. And it's not just the filthy rich who are excluded. It's the sort of kind of rich ones, too. The ones who may not have everything they want, but who usually have more than they need. <clears throat> like, say, the ones who can afford three different pairs of glasses for just two eyes. Dare I say it? The excluded ones are us. It goes against everything we have been taught. We have been taught to do our chores so that we won't get into trouble. We have been taught to work hard so that we may receive rewards. We have been encouraged to study hard in school so that we may do well and graduate and get a good job so that we can earn good money. Church seasons are predictable. And I'm not just talking about Advent leading to Christmas, to Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, although I know that most of you in this room, at least, could have recited that with me. But here's what's also predictable. It is predictable that not many people will attend an unair conditioned church in the dead of the summer. It is predictable that the congregation will build up during September into October, then we'll have weekends that are holiday weekends and a few less people will come. And then, whoa, we're in the middle of stewardship season and we will begin to talk about money in church and money for the church. So yeah, here we go, right? And this predictability holds true even in a pandemic when some of us are attending from home and some of us are attending in person. More of us are paying attention to our spiritual home today than were back in August. And so it is predictable that every year at this time, I think a lot about my dad. My dad, who served on the vestry of a couple of different Episcopal churches in his lifetime, and who was often part of a stewardship committee. Dad was the president of a bank. Of course they wanted him on the stewardship committee. It was my dad who taught me that those of us who have much are expected to know how to give some away. He would have said give some away. I remember my father getting ready for church on Sunday morning, making a little show of putting a crisp $20 bill into the offering envelope 60 years ago. $20 was a week's worth of groceries or a month's worth of gas. And when I questioned him about why he gave so much to the church, he said, we have a lot, so it is important that we give a lot. My father worked hard to become a rich man. And even though he sometimes drew a very large salary, I suspect that he never felt rich. He grew up in the Great Depression, and I think he was often afraid that all that he had worked for would disappear. Accumulating wealth was a positive value for my dad. And I really wish he were here so that I could ask him what he thought when he heard the words of Jesus it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle as that crisp $20 bill crackled in his vest pocket. Evidently, the disciples were dismayed by Jesus' declaration. In their culture, as in ours, riches buy leisure. And when one has leisure time, one can afford the time to study scripture, to make religious pilgrimages, to worship with greater frequency. So why on earth would Jesus be criticizing wealth? Don't we need wealth to attend to our religious obligations? Isn't it the rich who keep the, the church going? It is the poor who cannot afford to take on the time to go to the temple or pray at the appointed times. If we are not rich with the freedom to do our duties, how then will we be saved? <laughs> how will we save the world? 
And here is Jesus telling us that salvation is impossible if we have accumulated wealth, that we must give away all that we have. Jesus is contradicting himself, and that's so irritating. When he welcomed the little children, he told them and the disciples that all they needed to be saved was the innocence and wonder of childhood. And that's a pretty easy lesson to preach. He encouraged them to know that God loved them and welcomed them just as they were. There was nothing for them to do to be saved. So which is it? Is salvation free and easy? Or do we earn heaven by selling what we have and making a tally of the proceeds? Is our seat near the throne of grace purchased with the wealth that we give away? Which is it? Well, there's an answer in the setting of our gospel story today. Jesus has just taught Pharisees and his disciples and the children, and now Jesus is teaching a solitary man. That is, Jesus has entered into relationships with all sorts of different people, people who find themselves in different conditions. Some are rich and some are poor, some are old and some are young, some are powerful, some are marginalized. And yet, Jesus is there with each of them, teaching, guiding, and gathering them to himself. Now, Mark tells us he is setting off on a journey. Jesus seems to be as poor as a man can be. Born in a stable, refugeed to Egypt, then back to what at best could be a working class home. And he has now left all that behind. He has no clothing but what he is wearing. He has no spouse, no children. He has no job, at least not one that gets paid in money, right? And he surrounds himself with friends who have left their employment. And all that self-sacrifice does not save him from the trouble to come. Jesus will set out on this journey, and we know where he's going. We know how it will end. Whether the rich man accompanies him or not, whether his disciples continue to follow him or not, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. And there he will face the cross. And Jesus will die a poor man. And yet, of course, Jesus is rich. He is wealthy with the love of God. His wealth of wisdom and power flow from him in his ability to touch the people. He stumps the Pharisees, empowers the disciples, teaches the little children, Everywhere he goes, Jesus makes relationships with the people. Mark puts it this way. Looking at us, Jesus loves us. He does not gather stuff. He gathers people. And the riches of heaven are found in the relationships that Jesus makes. So which is it? Is salvation earned or is it free? Must we do something to be saved or are we saved already? I talked about my dad, so now I'll talk about my mom. Many years ago, my mother told me that she would host a Bible study group in her home if I would do the work of leading the discussion. That worked for me very nicely. So one night, sitting in my mother's living room, we read this passage, and one by one we shook our heads at the dumb, hard-hearted rich man who followed his possessions instead of Jesus. We felt quite sorry for him with all his riches, but no Jesus. Do I have to describe us? Sitting in a living room full of antiques? The coffee table laden with goodies. There was a bakery that my mother loved to go to. We content parents and grandparents of children attending good schools and expensive colleges. 
We looked down our noses at that poor rich man, and we did not even note the irony. And then one brave woman spoke up. What are you all talking about, she said. He came back. Of course, he came back. He was sad because he had a lot of stuff, and giving up your stuff is hard. Jesus sent him away to do something hard. And then he came back to follow Jesus. Jesus says it this way, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Grace is entirely free. We are saved without asking to be. Jesus reminds us of this when he throws his arms wide and welcomes all the little children to the table. But, but, Jesus calls us in our freedom. Jesus calls us into relationship with him and into relationship with all those whom he loves. And in those relationships, it is inevitable that we will use our stuff, our money, our things, our riches to help others. For God, all things are possible. The preacher to the Hebrews said it this way, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so we gather together week by week. We gather online and in person, working as hard as we can to protect one another's physical safety. We spend our money and our time and our talent for the good of others, and you'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. And whether our wallets are full or empty, or like most of us, there's a little bit in there. However it is, we are rich and overflowing in God's love. Now I invite you to stand with me as we affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. If you're following along in your service leaflet, we are toward the bottom of page five. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, God bless our bishop, Nancy, our priest, Jeff, our seminarian, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. 
that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for Joseph, our president, Charlie, our governor, and Donald, our mayor, and all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. We remember the still often recently departed and Luke, Norman, Bruce, James, and John Boyle. In those memory altar and memorials have been given and in memory of St. Louis Lanterne. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. And I invite you to offer your concerns either aloud or in the silence of your hearts. For John and Betty Adams, who will renew their wedding vows this afternoon. For Seth, Robert, Jess. God of the narrow way, you call us to shed all that burdens the lightness of life. Help us to surrender false wealth. Embrace our need of you and live for your kingdom above all things through Jesus Christ, the richness of God. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Amen. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with one another. Peace. Peace, peace Josh. Good morning, everyone. Please be seated for a couple of announcements. Welcome to the Episcopal Church of the Atonement here in Westfield, Massachusetts. We are glad that you are joining us in person or online by YouTube or Facebook or even Sunday evening on Channel 15, Westfield Public Access. More information about our worship services and activities may be found in your service leaflet and in our weekly email, which we call eNote. If you don't get eNote, you can subscribe to it. You can also find our service leaflet on our website. Go to atonementwestfield.org to learn more about us. So there are a couple of things that I want, there are also announcements in that service leaflet, but there are a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. One of them is that in the pews you will find a sheet that looks like this. It has a little uh, drawing of saints on it. It might be white paper, it might be pink paper. It's our custom here at Church of the Atonement to read the list of the names of our beloved dead on All Saints Sunday. This year All Saints Sunday is November 7th. So I invite you to help us compile that list 
by writing the names of the people you would like us to remember, putting it in the offering plate today. We also sent an electronic form home by email, and the link is broken, which we didn't realize. But we will fix that link, and next week it will come home in the electronic email, and you can get in touch with us electronically to give us those names so that we have a full list for All Saints Day. Thank you for that. Beginning this Tuesday, we are offering a new service that is also a way that we can get to know one another. So it's kind of a cross between online coffee hour and online prayer. On Tuesdays, every Tuesday at 7 p.m., we will host spiritual reflection for troubled times. So what we're going to do is we're going to gather and check in with one another. This is open to anyone who is awake at 7 p.m. and wants to join us by Zoom. If you need that Zoom link, email me and I will get it to you. Um, it's okay to come once. It's okay to come every single Tuesday. It's okay to come late. It's okay to leave early. And here's the big thing. There's no homework. There's nothing to read in advance. So those of you who have been used to meeting with me on Tuesday evenings for sacred ground discussions or for book group, you had two chapters to read or you had a whole movie to watch or whatever. No, no homework, nothing to do in advance, nothing to do afterward. An hour of discussion, no more than an hour of discussion on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. So there will be another email announcement about that early this week. We start this Tuesday at 7 p.m and I invite you to join us as you are able. And your friends are welcome too. You don't have to be a member of Church of the Atonement to pray, please, feel, feel welcome. Um, I meet with the children of atonement, those who cannot be vaccinated, so it's not particularly safe for them to gather indoors. I meet with them every Sunday at 9.15 on the playground. And today I sent home bags with each family the bags that have activities for each week. They go along with the gospel lessons that we are hearing in Sunday mornings during our Sunday morning services, and they are tied into a children's Bible, which I hope that each family has. But if your family needs a children's Bible and you don't have one, get in touch with me. I'll be sure that you have it. There are also some fun activities to do in this bag. So if you are a family with grade school or younger children and you want one of these bags, come on by the church and pick it up or come next Sunday to Prayers on the Playground at 915 and we will give you one. And the last thing I want to, no, I have two more things. Uh, this Thursday is the last farmer's market of the season. So if you haven't had a chance to get to the farmer's market, this is your last chance this coming Thursday from noon to five. And I want to thank our hardworking farmer's market committee for having such a wonderful offering um, throughout the season. And then this is my last announcement. Um, our parishioner, uh, Tammy Joseph, is sponsoring a Pfizer booster shot clinic at the rest home that she and her husband, Mike, um, own and operate. So if you want your third Pfizer shot, this is, you have to have had your first two, and this is only Pfizer, that's what they have. But if you want that third Pfizer shot, call Tammy Joseph or call me and I will put you in touch with Tammy. She's gonna have that clinic on October 28th. So if you're looking for your third shot and that's a convenient way to do it, please do let her know. Now this is the time in the service when we ask you to make a financial contribution if you can. Here in person, the offering plate is at the door of the worship space, where there are also baskets to accept contributions to our Little Free Food Pantry. We're also going to have a drive-through drop-off for the Little Free Food Pantry this Saturday from 9 to 11. If you're watching on our live stream, you will see a list of ways to give on your screen in just a moment. I've been told that slide has been updated and is very beautiful now, so that's good. Please know that every contribution that you make, including what you might be able to give today, goes to help this church share the transforming love of Jesus in a broken world. Jesus said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest.
Our service continues with the Eucharistic prayer, which is found on page 7 in your service leaflet. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high, by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, Holy One of Blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so, as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings in all creation as we shout with joy. has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing gave it to his friends and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so, remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts, your earth has formed and human hands have made. We acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time gather us with all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Sacrifice. 
of God, for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Our service continues in the middle of page 9 with the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, 
healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. My sisters and brothers and siblings, life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make this earthly pilgrimage with us. So be swift to love, make haste to do kindness, shower abundant hospitality on friend and stranger, walk in justice, that you may follow the path of mercy and love, and the blessing of God who comes to us unbidden, who for our lives was broken, and in whose spirit we are guided into wholeness and holiness of life, be upon you and those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.